Shalom, brothers and sisters. For this week's Sabbath message, I want to expand and do a part two uh, from the Thursday thought they had this week. It was on the role of women in Mormonism. I received a, a message from someone complaining quite a bit about the first video shortly after I put it out. And the big thing that they had to say was that the focus wasn't on true Mormonism because to them, true Mormonism was the Salt Lake City Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they were pointing out the fact that their women aren't ordained uh, until their current prophet president Women were, you know, they took covenants in their temples to be submissive to their husbands and to obey men, and really kind of the exact opposite of what I was talking about. And so their concern was that my Thursday thought wasn't really about Mormonism. But Mormonism, for me, isn't one church. And I understand if you belong to a church and you believe that church is the only true church on, upon the face of the earth, then of course, to you, that church is your religion. But I want to be clear that Mormonism is a part of Christianity. So if you want to look at it in levels, you have the Abrahamic faiths. We'll, we'll go really broad here. And among them, you have Christianity. And within Christianity, you have the Reformation. Uh, and within the Reformation, you have Protestantism. Um, and then among that, and, and some people like to say that we're a part of that, and some people like to say that we're not, we have this restorational group of movements. Seventh-day Adventists, Baptists, uh, I think Jehovah's Witnesses also, but basically this group of people who their idea was they wanted to go back to the book of Acts and figure out what the, the real original church, the apostolic church looked like and try to reinvent it. And we as, as Latter-day Saints are a part of, we're a subgroup of that group of restorationalists. Now within our movement, the Latter-day Saint movement, or what I like to call Mormonism, because we all use the Book of Mormon, and because Joseph Smith was a Mormon, we have a, a group of churches, sects, branches, denominations. Salt Lake City Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, the Brighamites, they're not the only group of Latter-day Saints. They're the largest, but they're not even the oldest. Uh, the Strangites actually came into existence, I think like seven years legally before they did. Um, what was it? Three years officially before they did? Because Brigham Young unofficially organized in uh, 40, 1847 and legally organized in 1851 and had everybody get baptized into his new church in 51, 52, and I think 53. So then, then on the other side, you know, you have the, the RLDS tradition, you've got just all these other people, all these other groups, all these other churches, sects, denominations. And, and so when I talk about Mormonism, I'm talking about our religion. And when I talk about our religion, I can't just look at one church. And so when I talk about the role, I, I tell you all of that, to tell you this, and five minutes in, because I want to tell you this. I'm going to be going over a number of different scriptures today talking about the role of women. And, and I also want to let you know that this is a topic I didn't really want to cover myself because as a man, it's not my role to tell a woman or women what their place is. So I also want to be very clear here at the beginning of this that what I'm trying to do here is share some of our religious views and part of what I'm going to be talking about in here today is the fact that the role of women is to be defined by the Lord and by the women. And I'll get into that as we move forward. But I want to start off with the very first revelation specifically to a woman. And I'm going to be going through Doctrines of the Saints to make it easy. And also, uh, I will tell you that I'm currently revising Doctrines of the Saints. So there's some scriptures I'm going to go through, some revelations I'm going to go through that are not necessarily going to be in the one that's currently online. But I'm still going to go over them and I'll tell you where they come from. So section 8a is a revelation from Joseph Smith to Emma Smith. And in it, it says, thou shalt be ordained under his hand, under Joseph's hand, 
to expound the scriptures and to exhort the church according as it shall be given thee by my spirit. This, and I'm going to get into this again as we move forward, but this is Emma's original call to be the elect lady, the co-president, in, in my opinion, the co-president, eventual co-president of the Church of Jesus Christ. That was not able to happen because Joseph Smith was martyred and things fell apart and there was just too much fighting, to be perfectly blunt. Now, section 8b, I'm going to jump forward to the fellowship. This is, remember, the fellowship is not a church. We're an ecumenical movement, but we do ordain women. And this revelation was given through me to my wife, Christine. In here it says that she is called, in verse 3, to help restore unto mankind that which they have discarded and thrown away. And then in verse 8 it says that she's been called to restore the right hand of God amongst the children of men, for the daughters of God have cried out unto the Lord, seeking to gain their birthright. Now, I want you to remember that term, birthright. That's key. In verse 9, it says that one of the reasons why Christine was born was to restore the pillars of our religion, of our faith. So what that means, that's something Christine has to figure out. I can't tell her that. But the Lord is basically telling her, you know, you are called, just like Emma Smith was, to be a part of this restoration. Now, in section 9 of Doctrines of Saints, I actually took the Nauvoo Relief Society notes, their records, for the foundation of the original Relief Society that no longer exists. It was actually destroyed by Joseph Smith in his lifetime. He, he tore it apart, which I think is a sin. And I personally believe is probably one of the things that led to him the allow that, and I personally believe is one of the things that probably allowed him to be taken when he died. Now, in this record, it talks about Emma Smith being called as president and having two counselors, very very similar to the way that the priesthood for the men is set up. So there's there's for me there's a bit of foreshadowing here. And then in verse 19, it really seals the deal by saying, If any officers are wanted to carry out the designs of the institution, let them be appointed and set apart as deacons, teachers, priestesses, elders, and high priestesses are among us. Now, in the original, it just says deacons and teachers, etc. And so I, through inspiration, added priestesses, elders, high priests, and priestesses. And I will tell you that Part of my reasoning for doing this, there's, I was looking for two witnesses. The first was the spiritual witness, and the second was actually a woman in the Brighamite version. She was a president of the Relief Society for the Brighamite Church when he created their version of the Relief Society without the priesthood. And in it, she said that she missed the days of Joseph Smith talking about them being priestesses. And so between that and some of the other things I'm going to get into today, we can say for a surety that women were always meant to hold the priesthood, that it was supposed to be restored to them. And if you look at Joseph Smith's chosen successor, James Strang, you will see that women were ordained to the priesthood in the church that he founded. Also, as we're going to see in a little bit, when Sidney Rigdon eventually started his church, the uh, Church of Jesus Christ and Children of Zion, it's set up very much in the same manner that Joseph Smith was starting here. So he was continuing the work that Joseph Smith started. Now, a couple things I want to point out here, and this is important to me because as someone who, you know, I, I, I said at the very beginning of this that I don't want to tell women what to do or how to do it. If you read this particular section, section nine, it talks about how the men came in and helped get things organized, but when the women were about their business, the men were not allowed in the room. Now, this is very different. There was actually a time when I was asked to sit in because a member of the bishopric couldn't be there. I was asked to sit in on a Relief Society meeting and when I was a Brighamite because there had to be a man present for them to be able to meet and, and, and be together. That is the exact opposite of what is happening here. And so therefore, I would say 
that our religion teaches that women are capable of governing themselves. So one of the roles in Mormonism for women is for them to govern themselves and not wait for a man to govern them. Now from here we're going to go into section 10. Uh, section 8 is broken up into two different sections currently that might change at some point. But A and B, A being for Emma Smith and B being for Christine Fairman. Now, section 10 goes through a series of revelations about women in the priesthood, starting with a revelation given through Sidney Rigdon, October of 1864. And this was originally recorded as section 15 in the book of revelations of Jesus Christ to the children of Zion. Now in this, it says very clearly, thus saith the Lord to his handmaiden, Sarah Newton. And here the Lord is calling her to do his will and stand before him for herself, that the Lord might organize a quorum of female prophets for the benefit of Zion. Now, this is very important, very important, because he's saying here, I want you, Sarah, to stand next to me, not next to a man and do what a man's telling you to do, but stand next to the Lord. And this so that she can organize a quorum of female prophets, not so that the men can organize it. This is in 1864. This is very progressive for its time, but it's right in line with what we were just reading in section nine with Emma Smith organizing the Female Relief Society. And here is what's key to me. Verse five and six. It is my will, saith the Lord, that this quorum should be free from all earthly authorities, that I, the Lord, might be their ruler without men or the sons of men having any claim to them by virtue of any Gentile covenant. These women are to go directly to the Lord to discover what it is that they're supposed to do. And then the revelation goes on to talk about the book of Revelation and how the prophecy of the woman who brings a man child that's caught up in the heaven, the wilderness, is talking about this restoration of the priesthood to women. And it says in verse 23, in all ages of the world where I, the Lord, ruled, profound respect and obedience was rendered to the mothers. So let all Zion render the same respect to the voice of the matronly authority. Thus saith the Lord, I have given to the priesthoods and children of Zion a rescuer. And was said to man at the beginning, Behold, saith the Lord, this order is in accordance with the faith and prayers of your father Adam before me. For he has the same respect for his daughters that he has for his sons. And it was his prayer that when the celestial order of the Ancient of Days was established, that his daughters should have a voice in that council. And I, the Lord, have appointed this prophetic quorum in obedience to his will to form part of the celestial council, and their voice must be heard in it. So what does that mean? That means that if we want to think celestial, we have to include the voices of the sisters. We have to have women in our councils or we're not thinking celestial. We're thinking lower tier, lower kingdom, lower glory. The patriarchy and the patriarchy alone is a lesser kingdom. That's what it's saying. And I want to bear you my testimony that that is true and correct, and this, this is the word of God to us as Latter-day Saints. This is our religion. And this is the true role of women in Mormonism. Now let's move on to section 10b. Here in verse 22 we read, For at the beginning there was a man and a woman. Verily saith the Lord, the order is in accordance with the faith and prayers of the first man and first woman. And being the order of the beginning, it must also be the order of the restitution. For it is through this order that cometh the restitution, and I would say restoration, of all things. 
Now, I just found out about these revelations this year. It's why they're being added now to the doctrines of the saints. But anyone that's familiar with the Book of Remembrance, the series of revelations that I received, uh, the first half of them were in January of 2016. It's the story that is being described in this revelation with Adam and Eve both being redeemed as equals and sharing their priesthood with their sons and their daughters. So what Sidney Rigdon is being told here, and this is in still October of 1864, it may be new to me from this year, but the information in it isn't new because the Lord told me this in 2016. And so we in the fellowship have known this for quite some time. This is merely another witness to that testimony of the role of women in Mormonism. Now, in section 10c, we receive the word of the Lord through his prophet and prophetess, Sidney and Phoebe Rigdon. Now, here it says, in verse 19, I, the Lord, said unto my servant Sidney, Take my handmaiden Phoebe alone and ordain her to the prophetic office before me. And he did as I directed him in faith of what was to come. Before that revelation was received about Sarah, Phoebe had already been, Phoebe Rigdon had already been ordained. So we know that Emma Smith and several other women in the Nauvoo Relief Society were ordained. We now know that Phoebe Rigdon, before the Children of Zion was organized as a church, she was ordained as a prophetess. So this idea of, of Sarah being ordained in the previous sections that's merely mirroring what has already happened to Emma and Phoebe. So Section 10D, Seeking Greater Understanding. President Wallace B. Smith of the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, now known as Community of Christ. He receives a revelation here about women in the priesthood. And this is for, obviously, his church, the Lord's church, but his part of the vineyard. It says, starting in verse 14, and by the way, this would be Section 156 in their version of the Doctrine and Covenants. I say unto you now, as I have in the past, that all are called according to the gifts which have been given them. This applies to priesthood as well as any other aspect of the work. Therefore, do not wonder that some women of the church are being called to priesthood responsibilities. This is in harmony with my will, and where these calls are made known to my servants, they may proceed according to the administrative procedures and provisions of the law. So this is an organizational change, but really, what are they doing? They're going back to the roots. They're going back to what happened with Emma Smith and the Navajo Relief Society. They're not doing anything new. They're doing it a new way. Instead of having a separate priesthood that works, you know, brotherhood and sisterhood that work together, like it was in the original church, like it was in Sidney Rigdon's church, they are doing things differently here in that they're basically just saying men and women are the same, they're going to have the same priesthood. So it isn't priesthoods like it was in, in Sidney Rigdon's revelations. And I, I think that for their church, that's that's fine. In the fellowship, we've been told that there'll be a brotherhood, a sisterhood, and those two will work together to create the order of the ministry. And it seems like they've skipped the brotherhood and sisterhood and gone straight to the order of the ministry. And if that's what the Lord's telling them to do, then that's what they should do. But again, this is Mormonism. This is the Latter-day Saint movement. And so once again, the role of women in Mormonism is to hold the priesthood and to be an authority in teaching and facilitating the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, women are equal to men. Now, I want to read a little bit from section 10E here because I think that this is important. This was a revelation to me. I had gone to the Lord and I asked the Lord, okay, I've got all this stuff together. What do I do about the women? What do I do about the release set? You tell me what to do. And the Lord told me, you mind your own business. That's what you do. He says, behold, I see that thou once again desire to know concerning the organization of the sisterhood of Christ. Yea, as I have said unto thee before, the high priestess and elect lady that shall be called in my name as prophetess, seer, and revelator. She shall do this work in my name. 
I have told thee the formation, and thou hast set it forth. But thou art of the Melchizedek, and they are of my high priestess after the order of the sisterhood of Magdalene. But this is why in the fellowship we have the low priest and the high priesthood, and the low priesthood is the priesthood of Aaron and the priesthood of Miriam, and the high priest is the priesthood of Melchizedek and the priesthood of Magdalene. This isn't something that we just made up. This is something the Lord gave us through revelation. And we see that as our religion grows, it's growing line upon line, precept upon precept. And you can really see these steps here as we're moving forward in Christ. We're growing as a people in his grace. But again, the role of women, this, this goes along with that revelation to Sarah that as a man, I can't tell the women what to do. They go to the Lord and they find out for themselves what the Lord wants them to do. I did not have access to that revelation when I received this revelation. And yet it's in perfect harmony. That is the harmony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you see multiple prophets saying the same things, you have to know it's true. When you see multiple prophets receiving revelations from the Lord, where it's the same and growing information, you have to know it's from that same God. And then finally, the most recent revelation that we have came from my wife, Christine. And this is currently section, well, and what I'm putting together now, I should say, section 10F of Doctrines of Saints. Again, this may change as I'm going through Sidney Rigdon and Phoebe Rigdon's revelations. And if that does, just take a look in the comments and you'll see the corrected information. But I want to read this revelation to you. It's important. It says that the Lord is displeased with the patriarchal hierarchy that has torn down the the Lord's daughters for generations. The Lord has, and we've seen this through every part of this video so far, the Lord has in the latter days set into motion the circumstances and provided the tools needed for the daughters of Zion to reclaim their spiritual power and their birthright. Remember the very beginning of this video when I said to keep in mind that idea of the birthright, the sister's birthright. Here we are again. The Lord reminding us that this power, this these keys and this authority, this is their birthright as the daughters of God. And here, this is key. The Lord is commanding the daughters, the sisters, to amplify their voices together in sisterhood and uplift and enrich one another. He commands us as men to open our minds and our spirits to these sisters, to listen to their voices, to uplift and work with them, and to stop trying to dominate over them. And at this point, there's nothing else to say. The revelation ends here. It's very short because the Lord has given the women of the restoration of voice. They merely need to claim it. Christine received this revelation in May of 2020. She actually received the revelation several months prior to this. Um, she, we were actually driving the car in November of 2019, and she was telling me the revelation. And man, I just was overwhelmed with the spirit. And I was like, "Stop the car! We got to write this down." She's like, "No, it's not time." But finally, in May of the following year, it was time, and she wrote that revelation down. And I want to bear you my testimony that this revelation is of the Lord, and it's true. And I can't tell you how many sister I've talked to, who. They don't feel like they're good enough. They've been a part of a church that has torn them down to a point to where they don't believe they can stand anymore. And that devastates me because it's halting the work of the Lord. So what's my Sabbath message for you today? It's simple. It's about hope. My message is that Mormonism is a religion of hope. It is a religion of equality. Joseph Smith taught us to be a people without creeds. He said that creeds hold us back because they don't allow us the freedom to get to know the Lord in a personal way. 
So we don't really need to worry about what the churches are doing. What we need to worry about is what we are doing as a people and what the Lord wants from us. And I think that between these two videos, one thing that is apparently clear is that what the Lord wants is for us to be one. And we can't be one if we are a people dedicated to oppression, to following an organization over the Lord, to bowing down to the authority of men, or pushing, unri or pushing unrighteous dominion in any way, shape, or form. We need to be a people of peace because our religion is a religion of peace. We need to be a people of hope because our religion is a religion of hope. We need to be a people of love because our religion is a religion of love. Because that's what Mormonism is. That is what our religion is all about. It's about building people. Sisters, I hope this video helps you feel that call of the Lord. Because you have been called. And brothers, I hope this humbles us a little bit. Society tells us that as the man, we should be in charge. But the Lord created us, men and women, as equals. And that is my message on the role of women this Sabbath. And I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.